If you're a committed Presbyterian, if you're a Calvinist, if you're Reformed, you're probably miserable. And that isn't the worst part about it. If you're Reformed, if you're a Presbyterian, and if you're a Calvinist, you think that being miserable gets points with God for you. We, after all, believe in the sovereignty of God, so if you have cancer, deal with it. If you've lost a kid, Romans 8.28 is all we can say, deal with it. If you're going through marriage problems, then that's tough, but God is sovereign, and he knows what he's doing, just deal with it. And don't smile, because this is a fallen world. You're to stand out as a light. Just deal with the pain and the wounds and the sin, because that's your lot. Men must work and women must weep, and the sooner it's over, the sooner to sleep. God is sovereign. You're a peon, so deal with it. I remember at a church that I served when we had healing services, I prayed about it, and I said, God, are you sure? And he was, and I did, but it required that I teach for weeks before we started them. And you know why I had to teach? Because I had seen so much drivel from the name it, frame it, claim it people who said that God meant for you to be healthy and wealthy and wise and had spoken so often against that that people, my beloved people in the church, had gotten to the point where they thought that God never said yes. They got to the point that I just described to you that whatever you're going through, no matter how bad it is, deal with it. Now, I believe, and you've probably heard me say, that every time a pagan gets cancer, a Christian gets cancer, so the world can see the difference. That every time a pagan goes through marriage problems, a Christian goes through marriage problems, so the world can see the difference. That every time a Christian loses his or her business, uh, that's because a pagan is going to lose his or her business, and they need to see the difference. Now, I believe that with all of my heart. But I also believe that if you focus on that too much, you miss the joy and the success that God would give his people. We have a theory and the theory is that if you're a Christian, you go through hell to get to heaven. And if you're a pagan, you go through heaven to get to hell. And so we bear it. We deal with it. We deal with our failure and our misery. But we say to the pagans, you're going to get yours. And you're going to roast. We're going through hell now, but someday we're going to be home. It's going to be okay. That's a lie. That's from the pit of hell, and it smells like smoke. The truth is, if Jesus was right, I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it abundantly. If the text we're going to study this morning is true, then we go through heaven to get to heaven. I remember those healing services, and I said to the congregation, I know what I told you, but that wasn't everything you need to know. Jesus is quite fond of you. He likes you, and he likes to say yes. All the promises of God find their yes in Jesus Christ. And I said during that time, we're not charismatics. You don't raise your hands, and you don't do weird stuff because we're Presbyterians. We had a young lady by the name of Patty who was in a wheelchair, and she got there because she tried to commit suicide with a gun and never again would be able to walk. And she would tell me that I should know Jesus is worth a wheelchair. <laughs> and she would sit in front. And while I was teaching, I said, we will not speak in tongues. Then I looked at Patty and I said, but if Patty gets out of that wheelchair, I will speak in tongues. <laughs> <laughs> and God did, God did some really neat stuff during that time as people began to realize that God was good all the time. And he has absolutely no vested interest whatsoever in making you miserable. Now, if you have your Bible, turn to the 18th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. This is that incident where the rich young ruler comes to Jesus. And he says to Jesus, how can I get into the kingdom? And Jesus says, be religious. Be nice, obey the rules, go to church, read the Bible. And the guy said, I know, I've done that ever since I was a kid. 
And then Jesus said, looking at him and knowing that he had a lot of stuff, said, you like one thing, you sell everything you own, you give it to the poor, and you come and follow me. Thereupon follows something very, very interesting. And I'm going to start reading at the 23rd verse. But when he, that's the rich young ruler, heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, looking at him with sadness, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then, then who, who can be saved? Jesus said, what is impossible with men is possible with God. Then Peter said, uh, see, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom who will not receive many more times more in this time. And in the age to come, eternal life. You hear about the four guys that were playing golf, and they got on the 18th hole. One of the men went into the clubhouse to pay uh, for the other four. And while he was gone, the three guys that were left were bragging about their sons. One man said, my son's a doctor, and he is so successful. In fact, he is making so much money that he gave a half-million-dollar house to one of his friends. The other guy said, you know, that's good. Let me tell you about my son. My son is a stockbroker, and he is making hand over fist more money than he can spend. In fact, he's doing so good, he gave an extensive stock portfolio to one of his friends. The other guy said, that's nice. My, my son has a Mercedes dealership. And he is doing so well. In fact, the other day he gave a brand new top of the line Mercedes to one of his friends. About that time, the other man came out of the clubhouse and they said, uh, Bill, how's your son? And he said, well, it's, it's not very good. He's a dancer in a gay bar. But he said, but he said, I think he's doing really well. He said, one of his friends gave him a half million dollar house not too long ago. And, and another one of his friends gave him a big stock portfolio, and he said, and one of his friends gave him a brand new Mercedes. <laughs> this morning, we're going to talk about success, and you say, well, it's about time. I've been, I've been into motivational stuff for a long time. You've never said anything about this. Some of you who are really theological and really serious about God are thinking, how could you? But we need to talk about it sometimes because there's something going on that isn't good within the context of the people of God. And it is an unfortunate syllogism. Premise. I'm a miserable sinner. Premise. Miserable sinners deserve nothing. Conclusion. I deserve nothing. And so we fail because we think that's all we deserve. We go through pain because we think that's all we deserve. We face hardships we don't have to face because we think that's all we deserve. I want you to know it's simply not true, and I'm going to give you a biblical syllogism, and it is as follows. Premise, you're a miserable sinner. Deal with it. Premise, you're forgiven without reservation and exception. You are loved. You are acceptable, and God isn't angry and is, in fact, quite fond of you. Conclusion, whatever a loving God deems right for you is yours. The uh, producer of our radio program was saying the other day, he'd been going to seminary classes, and I hadn't seen him there, and I said, Eric, you're not come into seminary anymore. He said, no, I prayed about it. God said he could deal with me better part-time than full-time. 
And what he was saying, because I know Eric, and Eric and I are a lot alike, he was saying, I'm not good enough, I'm not pure enough, and I'm not committed enough to do this stuff full time, so if it's all right with you, I'll sit in this little glass booth and do the radio programs. I understand that. I grew up in a family where there are lots of dysfunctions. My dad was a drunk. My mother was shaming. I, uh, I want you to know, it's hard. I grew up thinking, you know, I'm not good, and I'm not worthy, and I don't deserve anything, and I've struggled with it my whole life. And then I found a spurious, mixed-up, shallow, silly theological system called Calvinism when misapplied that said you can be religious, and misery is a positive. I want you to know that's not true. It's just not true. So, without further chit-chat, let's uh, check out this text. First thing I want you to see from the verses that I uh, read to you is an inappropriate concern. Look at verses 24 through 25. Jesus, looking at him with sadness, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God of God. Now, all of a sudden, we say, well, that doesn't say anything about success. That says that if you're successful and you've got money, you ain't going to make it. No, no, no. That's not what Jesus is talking about in this particular text. He is saying that your concern ought not be there. That if you define success in terms of your stuff, you're going to lose both. Let me give you the formula for success. The formula for success is being accepted and in the acceptance being absolutely free to be anything God wants you to be. And that's a definition of success. We've had some turnover in key life in the last couple of years. Most people have been with me for 20 or 25 years. And Dan Velker, who started as a teenager and whom I love more than I can possibly tell you, had been praying about it, and we prayed with him, and he thought he was being led to go into a wilderness ministry where he is right now, and God's using him in a wonderful way. And a month before he left, actually six months, because he gave us a long ramp-up time, I said to him, Dan, kidding, of course, I want you to work twice as hard as you've worked before. I want you to know I've noticed that there have been occasions when you were drinking a Coca-Cola. I don't want you to do that anymore. You owe, as a godly man, a man who is now going to be involved in a wilderness ministry, to give us an example of uh, diligence and effectiveness. I want you to work harder. He said, I am not. And then he said, what are you going to do, fire me? <laughs> That's the way we are with the world. The world defines all kinds of stuff for us that is success, and the truth is that we might get some of it and we might not, but it doesn't matter because we're acceptable. It's covered. He's fond of us. And so get this through your head. God loves you. He'll never let you go. You're free, and he's going to bless you. Then the second thing I want you to see in the text that I just read to you is not only an inappropriate concern, but an inappropriate question. This is the 28th verse. Uh, and Peter said, see, we've left our homes, and we have followed you. What's Peter saying? Peter's saying, what's in it for me? I've really given up a lot, that rich man Gave up nothing. What's in it for me? And I, and I want you to know that it's the question that's the problem, not what the question was. It was asking it because it said something about Peter that a lot of us believe, that we define success by what we want for ourselves and not what God wants for us. I have no goal. That's why Randy drives me nuts. <laughs> Randy is the most focused person I've ever known in my entire life. I've never seen anybody with more of a burden for souls than Randy. Or a guy who is so, so focused on being, uh, being used by God. That drives me nuts because I don't have any goals. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's probably not good. I, uh, my life's verse is whatever your hand finds to do, just do it. 
And I sort of look at God as a poker dealer. And that's not blasphemous. It's good imagery. And he deals the cards, and I play them as best I can. I spoke for the Greater Orlando Leadership Foundation not too long ago, and they're never going to invite me back. <laughs> I mean, these are the leaders in our city. And all morning, they had been with Gordon McDonald learning how to set goals, and nobody told me. And they wanted me to teach for four hours in the afternoon. Well, they should have told me. And I opened up with, I don't have any goals, and I don't think you ought to have any. <laughs> And they looked shocked, and I thought, hmm. <laughs> now, I believe you ought to have goals. I believe you ought to be focused. But I think you always should, should have them chiseled in straw and not in concrete. Because you see, what God has for you is better than what you've got for you. What God has for you is better than what you have for you. And so when the question was asked by Peter, dear old Peter, when Peter asked the question, he was saying, I got some stuff that would define success for me. How about me? Then I want you to see not only an inappropriate concern and an inappropriate question, and this is good, I want you to see an inappropriate repudiation. Now, uh, well, look at, the, look at 29 and 30. And Peter said, see, we've left our homes and we followed you. Then he, then he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Now, if Jesus had been a professor at a seminary, he would have said, Peter, that is an inappropriate question. Did you hear about the guy in New York that... Uh, preached the sermon, and he put the title in the newspaper, What Does God Say When You Say What's In It For Me? And he had a big crowd at church, and he got up and read the title and sat down. Now, I know he was not prepared, and that's a good way to cover it. And it, and it was a good way to teach a lesson, and it was probably right. But if you had been really, really religious, you would have said to Peter, you can't ask that question. Don't, after all Jesus has done for you, what do you mean what's in it for me? Peter, Peter, you've walked with Jesus all this time, and you've seen how much he loved you. How could you ask a question like that? Religious people drive me crazy. You ever hear people that say, they go through pain and say, I've never asked why? What's wrong with you? <laughs> if, if they tell me I'm terminal tomorrow, two things are going to happen. The first is I'm going to pour lighter fluid on my treadmill and celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the second thing I'm going to do is say, God, what are you doing? Why? And God loves me, and he knows that it's human to ask why. Are you... And the thing that's worse about religious people are ones that are health food addicts. They put me, a God's little joke at every banquet at which I've ever spoken, they put me by somebody who looks down his or her nose at the cherry pie. And that's the only thing edible at those banquets. <laughs> they always say, you're not going to eat that, are you? And I say, yeah, and I'll eat yours. Two, if you, you know, people get really religious. What's in it for me? It's okay to ask that. You may not get an answer right away, but the interesting thing here that Jesus did is that he didn't get religious on Peter. He answered his question. He said, Peter, you're not going to believe this. You're going to get so much success. So much stuff, and then when you die, you're going to have eternal life. You go through heaven, and you get to heaven. Is that good? Jesus answered Peter's inappropriate uh, question. And then I want you to see, and this is the final point, an inappropriate oversight, and you shouldn't miss it. It's 29 and 30 where Jesus says all of this many times more in this time, and then he says in the age to come, eternal life. I'm not stupid. Uh, I've buried a lot of babies. I've cleaned up after a lot of suicides. 
I've had my own pain, and I've shared pain with more people than I can even remember. I want you to know that I've been doing this for a long time. We get 7,000 letters a month at our ministry, and many of those are people who are just dying. I'm aware of that. And sometimes God allows, sometimes God in his sovereign graciousness allows you to go through a really, really tough time. I have a friend, Michael Joyce, who lives in Miami, and he's a lawyer, and he's the least religious person that I know. He can cuss, and he loves Jesus with all of his heart. I remember the day when he became a Christian. It was very understated, and he meant it to be understated. He came out the door of the church, and he said, uh, Steve, I did a C.S. Lewis this morning, and he walked off into the parking lot, and I didn't know what he was talking about. And I thought, oh, man, that means he became a Christian. I chased him down, and I said, Michael, that's so good. You're now my brother. And, and he said, yeah, I guess that's okay. And he's not religious at all. And we found out a few months ago he's got cancer. Uh, it's, it's all, the reason I tell you he's not religious because he wouldn't do something like this. And we've wept with him, and we've prayed with him, and he's in remission now, and it's really good. But I, but I said, Michael, it's got to be really hard. And he said, you know what, I, Steve, you know what I've been doing? He said, at night when I know I'm going to suffer, I did something I never thought of before. He said, I've given my nights of suffering to others. I said, what? He said, well, I say, Lord, this is going to be an awful night. It's a night of suffering, and I want to give this to Martha because she's going through a divorce. The next night he said, Lord, this is not any fun, and I want to give my night of suffering to Jim, who just lost his job. And he said, Steve, I gave you a night of suffering. I just wanted you to know that. And Michael's in remission now, and his hair's growing back. I prayed it wouldn't. Let me tell you something, it's really cool. It's growing back curly, and it wasn't curly before, which is a good God who blesses pain. Yeah, you're not home yet. Sometimes it's really hard, but don't make it harder than it is because God likes to say yes. <laughs> Let me tell you a true story. I don't remember, that it was a pastor, and the friend who told it to me said it was true. This pastor had a kitten, and the kitten went up into the uh, tree in his backyard close to his driveway, and it was one of those really thin trees, and the kitten couldn't get down, so the kitten was meowing all the time, and the pastor said, if I climb up that tree, it'll break, and uh, I'll get killed. So, so he came on a great idea. Pastors are very bright and resourceful, and so he said, what I'll do is tie a rope to this tree, put it on, the, on my bumper, and then I'll pull very slowly the tree down. When the cat gets down enough, I'll reach up and get the kitten, and it'll, be, it'll work. So that's what he did. And he was very, and he, grew, and, he, and he was going so slowly, just pulling a little bit at a time. And when he almost got the tree down low enough to get the kitten, the rope broke. <laughs> and that cat, <laughs> yeah, that's what, <clears throat> that kitten, went up and over two houses and just kept, <laughs> kept going. And the pastor said, he looked, said, I look for that cat, but there's some problems that are just not fixable. And, and so he couldn't find the cat. And, uh, and he was in a grocery store line the next week, and the woman in front of him had cat food, and he thought that was strange because she was a cat hater. So he said to her, Sarah, what are you buying cat food? I think you like cats. She said, Pastor, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> said, my little girl, she's five, and she wants a kitten. And she said, Mom, could I have a kitten? And I said, no, you can't have a kitten. She said, Mom, please. And I said, no, I'm not putting up with a cat in this house. And she said, what if God gives me a kitten? And he said, you're getting ahead of me. And, and, he's, and, and uh, she said, I told her, if God gives you a kitten, you can have a kitten. She said, Pastor, you're not going to believe this, but I swear it's true. I saw it with my own eyes. My little girl is kneeling in our backyard with her hands folded, <laughs> praying that God would send her a kitten. And a kitten came right out of the sky and landed in front of her. <laughs> now, some of you are saying, that's an accident. 
Some of you are saying we're miserable sinners and God doesn't give kittens. Listen to me. When God gives you a gift, rejoice and thank him. When he opens a door, walk through it. When you look at Atlanta as perimeter and you want to make an impact, go for it. And thank God that he's good and he's kind and he loves you. And he gives his beloved people kittens. You think about that. Amen.